is the Ingram angle tonight. Senator Susan Collins driving what could be the final nail in the coffin for the Democrats' resistance against Brett Kavanaugh. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will join me exclusively in moments, revealing what he said to Collins in today's lunch meeting just moments before she said yes to Kavanaugh. And amidst the Kavanaugh fight, the Me Too movement is now hitting the boardroom, but not in the way that you might think. Raymond Arroyo is here with me for Friday Follies, and you will want to stick around for Diamond and Silk. It's not Friday without Diamond and Silk. But first, the Democrats' phony victim play. That's the focus of tonight's angle. The Democrats and many on the left worked around the clock to kill Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court. But I think they made a fatal miscalculation. They thought it was okay along the way to jettison the principle of due process and to use victims to pursue a radical political agenda. And on this first year anniversary of the Me Too movement, I think it's important to remember that this all started with liberal Democrat Harvey Weinstein, friend of Bill and Hillary's, and of course, Barack Obama. Uh, and remember, he, the Hollywood mogul, big, big mega donor. I mean, this guy is where it all happened. And remember, the abuse there started the cultural moment of Me Too. This notion of objectifying women and using them for the pleasure of the powerful has been long nurtured by the left. At the same time, they're like, oh, we're so pro-women. As we abuse women on the casting couch, etc. And the uh, entertainment industry had the target on its back. But now we see the same mentality at play in the Kavanaugh struggle. For all their claims to be defenders of women, the Democrats cynically and I think cruelly used Christine Ford in a desperate attempt to derail a Supreme Court nominee. Remember, she didn't initially want to come forward to tell her story. She, she was dragged into the open by political leaks to the Washington Post and other media outlets. And remember, reporters surrounded her home. And then she was forced to tell her story. And today, we learned of more dirty tricks from these activist lawyers behind the scenes. Remember Leland Kaiser? She was the person who Ford claimed was at the party where Kavanaugh allegedly assaulted her, one of her close friends. Well, Kaiser previously told the Senate committee that she didn't know of such a party and didn't even know Kavanaugh to begin with. Today, though, she told the Wall Street Journal that uh, in, that, in the FBI, that a foreign engineer, the defeat of this nomination, cared little, if at all, for her well-being. Professor Ford testified that a very limited number of people had access to her letter. Yet that letter found its way into the public domain. And today, Dianne Feinstein left no doubt as to what this nasty, senseless battle was really all about all along. The left's desire to use the Supreme Court to impose liberal social values on society. Another issue that gives me great pause is Judge Kavanaugh's extreme view on guns, the challenging realities women face. Roe v. Wade, what kind of medical care you can receive? Well, this has been a problem for decades. The American left believes the court should be kind of a super legislature, a body that makes law rather than interprets law. Since Trump announced his candidacy to the presidency, the left has been in perpetual rage mode. And of course, this continued into the night, and it's going to go on for some time. And this is how they attempted to influence Susan Collins before she announced her vote. Check it out. Don't put a liar on the court. 
Ah, nice. And this is how they work their charms on Democrat Joe Manchin after he announced he was supporting Kavanaugh. At least it's a one word chant. It's easy to follow. You know what's really shameful? Democrats who use victimhood as their defining principle. They'd rather have people dependent on government. Helpless without it, especially certain groups, minorities, immigrants, and even women. We're supposed to believe that we can't survive and thrive without an act of victims. We're not powerless or weak. We're strong and independent. This was the Democrats' miscalculation. They thought emotional extortion and protester histrionics would be enough to block a well-qualified Supreme Court nominee. But once again, they let their rabid political ideology blind them to the fact that Americans are fair minded, have a basic goodness about them, and they're optimistic about the future. They don't need an activist Supreme Court to see the light, to know where we are as a people, to see our future. And that's the angle. Joining me now is Code Pink's founder, co-founder, Medea Benjamin, and former Kavanaugh colleague, Helgi Walker. She also served as associate counsel to President George W. Bush and clerk for Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. Great to have you both on. Medea, uh, do you deny that the left ended up sadly using Christine Ford as a political cudgel in this battle? No, not at all. I think her story was a important one to be heard. I think uh, so many of these women who came in from around the country, I was in Lisa Murkowski's office, I was in Senator Collins' office, they wanted to tell their stories. They wanted, it's a flooding of emotion. And I think um, people need to hear these stories. I think it's unfortunate uh, that it doesn't look like we're so going to be able Trump to... emotions trump fact? Uh, emotions are part of fact. Emotions... Not necessarily. Yeah, but I think in this case, uh, the opening of the possibility for women to tell their stories has been What's just... What's preventing... I, I keep, I'm sorry, but I keep hearing this. Women can't tell their stories. Women are strong, more than half the population. I think mostly more than half of law school classes today. Uh, more than half of university enrollment are women. But this idea that women are these damsels in distress and we don't have a voice and we can't... Then we you can speak anytime we want. have had a, a, the fortune, good fortune, of not being molested at a young age. Uh, um, Medea, don't pull that card on me. What I'm saying is that the idea that women are damsels in distress and they need an activist Supreme Court to rescue them. And the trauma of sexual Why did Christine Ford's understand. name get outed? You don't, I, I don't Why know. did her name get outed? No, but it was outed. And she, she didn't want chance. it to be outed. She, she, she was used. She wouldn't have come to Washington. They she used her. Did she look story. happy to be there, Medea? Obviously She not. didn't want Nobody's, to be there. It's terrifying. They dragged her in there. It was terrifying. They used her. Important. Let's say, Laura, can you, we agree on one thing? They it used is her. It's good that women are now coming out and telling their stories. Is that a positive thing? They used you, Christine you think Ford. A, I think it's a Medea, wonderful thing. If I they may. used her. And that was a sad thing to use her to they try to kill this nomination. Her. They gave her the They abused her. To tell she her did story. not she did not want to be there and she made that clear in the first few minutes of her testimony. She never wanted a public hearing and for some reason, I don't know why, she never even knew that Senator Grassley had offered that the judiciary committee staff could come to her in California or offered a private hearing. Did her lawyers not tell her that that was an option? What did they want, Helgi? They wanted a public spectacle, and that's exactly what they got, Laura. They wanted a circus. They wanted to flood the Capitol with the victim stories. They wanted to uh, besiege senators in elevators and yell shame and spit in their faces and get a centimeter from people's faces like they're horrible people because they don't think that you should jettison due process they because didn't. because you have an agenda to kill off a, a Supreme Court nominee. Senator I Collins think it's, yeah, said I think it it's best. They, did, they did not too. care about Dr. Ford's feelings or well-being in the slightest bit. Of course they did. And they gave her an opportunity that she wanted. And they've given women in general an opportunity. And this is going to change history. It might not change who's on the Supreme Court, but it's going to change the way parents bring up their, their sons. It's going to change the way uh, young people relate to each other. It's going to change the way men act towards women. Well, um, and that's a positive. This thing. is a Women's March tweet that went out today, Medea. Um, I think we have it up on the screen. Senator Susan Collins, rape apologist. Do you agree with that tweet? 
I wouldn't say she's a rape apologist. I would say she didn't listen to the women who, uh, so in such a uh, heartfelt fashion, came to tell her, please um, listen to survivors, believe women, believe Dr. Do you th Ford. So do you think all women, regardless of facts, years past, no contemporaneous corroboration, in fact, people that she claimed were in the room, signed sworn statements saying, I wasn't there, I don't even know Kevin, including her best friend. And she so said despite she's 100% certain. And okay, then, so I, all I, four I, people I, in the room were lying. Another thing that has really gotten to us a lot is the way that Brent Kavanaugh acted at that hearing. Oh, and oh, I think that's important because oh, really? I don't want you a judge in a courtroom with a judge. I've been in a lot of courtrooms. Yeah, if you don't you know, you don't know what judge judges are like. Arrogant, petulant, sarcastic, yeah. mean, aggressive. I mean, even Judge John Paul Stevens, so the just, the retired Justin, if, if somebody, a lifelong somebody, Republican, if, after watching that. Said yeah, a lifelong, a lifelong liberal activist if judge on the bench. Flat out lied about you on a national stage. Would you be upset? And I was going to be one of the nine people out of how many 350 million people in this country that was going to sit on the Supreme Court. I would sit there and have a much more deferential attitude. Okay, so it's always, the first it was he was a rapist, and he was he was a gang rapist, and then he was. He drank too much, and then that didn't work. And then he's like, "Well, he was aggressive, like Nasty, Cory Booker." Nasty, mean. Oh, please! I mean, sarcastic. Well, guess what? Disrespectful to the senators. Three hundred court opinions. Three hundred court opinions. Overwhelming reaction by by people on the left and right who appeared before him in twelve years on the federal bench, Medea. Twelve years, not a day on the on the on the Senate Judiciary Committee, but twelve years have the utmost respect for his judicial temperament, reasoning, and authority. And so then the he idea went up to the next level, which is to get on the Supreme Court. And, he's, and he, he failed the test. Oh, really? He's, it's called Absolutely. two words, Medea, life tenure. He's going to get confirmed tomorrow. Okay, I want to play something for you. This is uh, Susan Hennessy, and I just happened to catch this leaving my house today because I like to turn on other networks just to get some comedy, comedic relief. This is someone I've never heard of, but her name is Susan Hennessy. And it was so unhinged on a Friday night. I thought I'd play it for you, Helgi. Let's watch. Okay. The extent to which Senator Grassley relies on women to do his dirty work to actually get the job done whenever he needs votes over the line just speaks to how unbelievably tone deaf Ugh. these individuals are. I do think that it, it touches into the same sort of incandescent incandescent rage that we are seeing mm -hmm. in response to the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation. Mm -hmm. That's a big phrase, incandescent rage. Ooh, okay, you got that. And Grassley's relying on women to do his dirty. So what, what does she, that mean? What does she we say? exclude women from the vote? Susan Collins is controlled by Chuck Grassley. Susan Collins stood up and gave an incredible speech in the tradition of Senator Margaret Chase Smith. She spoke to reason. She spoke to fact. She gave a very principled explanation. An hour. And thank, thank goodness, Laura, somebody broke through this morass and brought some common sense and some decency and maybe reset this process to something near normal. Real quick, well, yeah. here we see the difference because I thought Murkowski's speech was very heartfelt, Collins. very deep, and very uh, good. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Murkowski said, she lost me when she said, our role of advice and consent. It's advise and consent. I'm sorry, if you're a U.S. senator and you don't know it's advise and consent, she, sorry, you she already lost me there. the heart. But Medea corroborated Interview that and destroyed he failed you. it. He actually didn't fail it because he's going to be confirmed well, on the Supreme Court. It. Okay, well, that's a different... <laughs> That's a different way of scoring it. Uh, ladies, thank you very much for being here tonight, both of you. Medea and I go way back from the early 2000s. Thousands on radio. It's great to see you. And it's no secret at this point that the grassroots protesters at the Capitol are often funded either directly or indirectly by some George Soros affiliated groups. Now, we've shown you the evidence of that. But for daring to raise this possibility, Senator Chuck Grassley was called an anti Semite. A New York Times op ed writer, David Leonard, writes Let's be clear here. Charles Grassley is a United States senator. He's responsible for his words, and his words are are here amount to an anti-Semitic smear. Michelle Malkin joins us now with reaction to that craziness and how it's uh, this, this crazy kind of sometimes mob mentality seems to be taking over politics and certainly Capitol Hill. Uh, Michelle, 
Did George Soros have any involvement in the funding of like this, what is it, the Center for Popular Democracy, where they, the ladies cornered poor old Jeff Flake in the elevator the other day, and he looked very scared? Yeah. Were they involved in yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, the Center for Popular Democracy is... Uh, aligned with George Soros's entire network, and he is the the son uh, in the center of a, a galaxy of these left wing resistance groups that have morphed over time. Whether it was Move On or your previous guest, Medea. Benjamin's Code Pink. Now there's a, a new generation of these groups, and, and CPD is one of them, along with Code Pink 2.0, ultraviolet. And it is the protest orchestration, I think, that really needs to be investigated, not only among the funders and the philanthropists that back these professional mobsters, but also the people that they were coordinating with within the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's still not is answered who gave the Senate gallery passes to people like Linda Sarsour uh, and Piper Parabo and these others who from day one, second one, minute one of the hearings were enacting the plan that they have announced ever since uh, uh, Donald Trump won office. Um, and I think that the Senate Democrat wrecking machine is not going to give up after Judge Kavanaugh is uh, nominated and approved tomorrow. They're going to go on all the way through the midterms and 2020. And I think it behooves the right and the conservative movement, Laura, to make sure that we don't leave a vacuum in these spaces. Yeah, well, Michelle, you took the words out of my mouth because you really have to hand it to the left's power to organize. I really give it to them because they sh they bust people here. They put them up at, you know, local churches. They all like print out the same glossy posters, Kavanaugh. That was actually kind of clever, I have to admit. Uh, but, they, you know, they, they, <laughs> they get their word out. I mean, and they really did, I think, ultimately delay this vote for a week. They were ultimately not successful, but they dragged this thing out for another week. And look, until the, the last vote is cast, I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed. Anything can always happen. Same. Uh, yeah, yep. everyone needs a taste tester tonight, don't you think, Michelle? Like everybody should have their food <laughs> tasted. Uh, but yes, they did. They did have an effect, and they are cowing some of these uh, more moderate senators. So they they ultimately voted for, or they will vote for Kavanaugh. Yeah, you know that we we do need boots on the ground. There are millions of us women, for example, Laura, who feel the same way we do, and you voiced it well in that previous segment, who rely on facts and logic, and who believe, as I do, that we need to believe evidence, not gender, as the default. And you know, it is hard for these elected officials when they've got screaming, baying mobs of these feminist hounds, and nobody on the other side to counter them. And I always hear, of course, from a lot of small business owners and parents and, and family members on the right, well, we have full-time jobs, so we can't be right. there. And obviously, on election day, they will have a, a voice and, and a vote. But, you know, maybe it's time we pay full-time people to, to, to answer, answer that and make sure that we are represented on the ground in the Beltway, because it's not going to stop. All right. There are a lot of conservative businessmen making a ton of money in this economy, this Trump economy. They got to pony up money. Yes. I mean, the Democrats are doing it. Steyer's doing it, registering hundreds of thousands of people to vote, including young people, uh, Puerto Rican voters moving to Florida. That's a big deal. And you yes. know, it's, it can't be all on you, Michelle, to, to pull us yes. over the finish line, hey, all right? <laughs> and I want to say one more part of the plan, which is I, I heard that you're going to uh, move to Alaska and run for Senate against Murkowski. I'm going to move to Hawaii and run against that crazy Maisie Hirono. <laughs> right? That would be fun. Although I'd rather be in Alaska than Hawaii. You want to trade? Uh, no, I, I'll do the fly fishing. <laughs> you can do the surfing down there. Uh. <laughs> As those who have known him best have attested, he has been an exemplary public servant, 
judge, teacher, coach, husband, and father. Mr. President, I will vote to confirm Judge Kavanaugh. That was Senator Susan Collins delivering a crushing blow to Democrats, hoping for a last-minute defection. During her nearly one-hour-long speech earlier today, she echoed many of the sentiments offered on the Senate floor day after day by our next guest. We're happy to be joined exclusively tonight by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Senator McConnell, when did you know you had the votes? <laughs> when, the, when the roll was called. <laughs> no, really? You didn't? Yeah, they, they were all uh, very guarded about, uh, about making an announcement. So this is one of those rare situations when you go into a vote not really knowing for sure you had had them. Because you usually call cloture, you, you don't usually call cloture unless you know you have the ultimate votes, well, we, correct? We had to move on this. I mean, this, this was not going to get any better if we didn't vote. I decided a week ago we were going to vote on Friday because we, we watched what was happening. They were trying to destroy this good man with all these rumors and all the rest of the stuff. So it need, we needed to have the vote in order to bring it to, to a conclusion. Why didn't Senator Mikowski ultimately go along? Uh, we got Flake and you got Collins with that long speech today. She, I mean, she really impressed a lot of people with her passion and her dedication to advising consent. What happened to Murkowski? Well, you know, I'd rather celebrate the victory. And I think there's plenty of credit to go around President Trump for making great choices. And Chairman Grassley for doing a heck of a good job in committee dealing with all these outbursts. Uh, my members dealing with, uh, I mean, we've been under assault, Laura. They're, they're, our homes have been, uh, uh, they've come to our homes. Yours was today, this morning. Yeah, but not, not just me, everybody. I mean, they, they've been after all of us. We've, we've sort of been under assault. And everybody decided to stand up to the mob, you know, to not, to not be intimidated by these people. I just couldn't be prouder of my members for refusing to roll over under all of this intense uh, pressure and all these lies. Um, this is a great day for America. The Senate is under siege. The protesters don't seem to be letting up, even uh, late in the afternoon into the evening uh, tonight. Uh, is this the new normal? And I want to play something. This is Sen Senator Manchin. This was after the Collins uh, uh, speech today mm -hmm. and after he said he would vote for Brett Kavanaugh. Let's watch. Look at us! 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 Shame! 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 Based on what you've seen, was that an assault investigation? A lot of my radio callers today said, is this the way it's going to be? I mean, is there going to be any changes to building access? You don't want to become cocoon, but any changes to to how you let people into the building? Well, I think security will take care of that. Look, I, I think the main point is that the mob was not able to intimidate the Senate. We stood up to the mob. We did the right thing for a good man. I filled a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. There's a lot to celebrate today. I couldn't be prouder of all of my members. Senator Collins was outstanding. You had part of her speech in the, uh, in, in the entry. But the Democrats now have raised, just during her speech, they raised almost $2 million on a GoFundMe page for an undetermined candidate. And Susan Collins is apparently seriously entertaining, Susan Rice, excuse me, entertaining a challenge against Senator Collins in 2020. Your uh, thoughts? Senator Collins would be well-funded, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, look, there's a lot of enthusiasm on our side, too. You may or may not have noticed the rising enthusiasm among Republican voters. I think our people are going to be just as fired up as theirs a month from now, and everybody's going to remember what they did to Brett Kavanaugh. Is this the shot in the arm that the Republicans needed? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is an, it, it's, it's a, it's a wake-up call to why it's important to hold the Senate. You know, the Senate's in the personnel business. I love the House, but the Senate's in the personnel business. If you want to get judges confirmed, cabinet members confirmed, boards and commissions confirmed, we have to control the Senate so the president's nominations can actually be confirmed and take the jobs. Do you intend to use this issue on the campaign trail for the last four weeks, and what are you going to say about it? Absolutely. I'm going to remind everybody of the importance of the Senate. For two Supreme Court appointments, 26 circuit judges, a record for the first two years. These are lifetime appointments with conservative men and women who believe that the job of a judge is to interpret the law as it's written. Well, what, what about um, repercussions for what happened during this process? I, have, I was here for Judge Bork. I was young uh, 
speechwriter in the Reagan administration. I was here for Justice Thomas, obviously. But I think this actually rivaled both of those. It was brutal. And Lindsey Graham was on with us last night, and he talked about the need for repercussions against the wrongdoers in the I think it'll be investigated, but you know, it didn't work. I think the most important thing to note here is these tactics did not but You don't work. want to go through this again. You want to pay, well, people need to pay. What for I want these people document. to know, Laura, is we're prepared to go through it again. They're not going to intimidate us. They're not going to tell us how to vote. And they've actually, you know, they actually helped us win this vote. Their tactics actually helped us unify our people and win this vote. They're going to help us win a month from now on November 6th, too. Uh, do you think you'll pick up Senate seats and I hope so, so which one? I hope so. This, this underscores how important it is. I mean, we have a close margin, a very close margin. I'd like to have a few extra Republican senators. Let's talk about the media's role in all of this, <laughs> amplifying charges. We had uh, another point I want to play from Susan Collins when she talked about the rape rooms and the, these words that were being thrown around against this esteemed judge. Let's watch. The allegation that when he was a teenager, Judge Kavanaugh drugged multiple girls and used their weakened state to facilitate gang rape. This outlandish allegation was put forth without any credible supporting evidence and simply parroted public statements of others. Including the media, a celebrity yeah. porn lawyer. I mean, I can remember when that sort of thing was not put on the air. I mean, people didn't just peddle uh, nonsense with no corroboration. That really exacerbated the problem. And a lot of the Senate Democrats, of course, would mainstream that stuff right into their discussions and try to convince everybody that it somehow happened. No corroboration at all, just rumors all over the place. Senator Merkley from Oregon was quite upset today. He said this. Chuck Grassley, the chair of the committee, and Mitch McConnell, the majority leader. They said there's no contempt contemporaneous evidence to support the women who came forward. That is not true. What are we missing here, Senator? I, I don't know what he's talking about. <clears throat> but, um, there, there was no evidence to corroborate any of the allegations against uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, he, maybe he's on a different planet, I'm not sure. Right now, when you look back on this last you know, couple of weeks, and you've had an incredible run of confirming circuit court judges and district court judges, but I think it unified our conference, made us excited about the November election. It was good for the American people to see that these people were stood up to and they didn't get away with it. They did not win. That's the most important thing. How radical has the Democratic Party of today become? It's a pretty wild bunch. I mean, it's pretty clear they were willing to do anything, say anything, to try to win. You no still, boundaries. You still have close friends in the Democratic caucus after all this, or motion's pretty raw? I think we'll get past it in terms of relationships, but uh, Sorry. It's Friday, which means it's time for. Oh, it's Friday.
Friday Follies, where protesters get creative outside Mitch McConnell's house, and sexual politics are taking over boardrooms and classrooms. For all the details, we're joined by Raymond Arroyo, Fox News contributor, comedian during breaks, and New York Times bestselling author of the Will Wilder series. Uh, Raymond, tell me about the early morning protest outside of McConnell's townhouse. Imagine it's 7.30 in the morning and you're awakened by a protest coming up the block. He can imagine Mitch McConnell. Elaine, what is that out there? And then he saw this. Watch. And they're saying, I like beer. I like beer. Now, remember, Brett Kavanaugh at his hearings did mention this. Mm. We drank beer, uh, my friends and I, the boys and girls. Yes, we drank beer. I liked beer. Still like beer. We drank beer. We liked beer. You see, my question is, I don't know what this protest is about. About. Because if you don't like the guy, why are you mimicking his words? Uh, or do you support him or not? I mean, it seemed like any random morning on Frat Row at Dartmouth. I mean, this is what we were doing. <laughs> and I mean, it didn't look like much of a protest. It looked more like a collection of disgruntled neighbors just wanting to wake yeah, Mitch they, McConnell up. Yeah, they had like a zoning grievance yeah. with Mitch McConnell. Now, Laura, this was a creative protest compared to what was going on in the bowels of the Capitol, okay? This is an organizer giving his marchers orders, marching but uh, are they in kindergarten? You be the judge. Summon to vote. Summon to vote. Let's go watch the vote. Let's go watch the vote. In offices that you wish to communicate with. In offices that you wish to communicate with. I am going to go to Heidi Heitkamp's office. I'm going to go to Heidi Heitkamp's office. Why? She's on our side. And you wait, can she's go to side? the offices you go wait, to. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> they were going to the wrong office. Right. Why are they going to Heidi Hyde camp? Like, wait, zombie. Is it co-zombie? <laughs> she's on our side. Oh, totally, totally my bad. But why do you have to have a chant and, and echo for basic orders? We're like, going. we're going to go to the offices. We're going. We're, we're going, going to the offices. To to, to the offices, the, the offices. offices. Okay, right. the Me Too movement is getting a pretty big birthday present. In California, the governor signed a bill requiring public corporations to, in his state to have at least one female director on their boards. By 2021, every board will have to have three female Yay. directors. Do you think this is even constitutional, Laura? Well, I think Pacific Islanders, uh, Latino Americans, <laughs> and every other uh, group should say, what about me? How about me men? Too. I just want men to be on the all-female boards. Then there might be parity. What all-female boards? There are no all-female well, boards. Let me tell you about this selfie yeah. suicide uh, movement that's happening. Yeah. Uh, the Indian Real Health quick. Services did a study. 259 people in seven years l lost their lives taking these risky selfie shots, um, mostly men people between 10 and 29, but that number is really low. They're saying it's almost 250. It's much higher than that. And all this Kavanaugh madness has the American Civil Liberties Union undermined their core mission. Among the most outrageous ads to come out of this Kavanaugh fight was the one in which the judge was compared to Bill Cosby and Bill Clinton. Well, our next guest says the group's uh, no longer really a bunch of civil libertarians, that they're, quote, serving a different master now. Here to explain what he meant by that is former ACLU vice president, Michael Myers, along with civil rights attorney Will Juwando. Uh, Michael, I want to start with you. Uh, it seems like the ACLU is kind of 
kind of forfeited the, their founding mission in favor of what? I guess just a leftist smear? Yes, in terms of lunatic politics of the left. The ACLU, and when I was proud of it, I served on the board of ACLU for close to a quarter of a century. I was proud of it when it, when it resisted fashion, when it stood up against to the mob, when it insisted on the cornerstone of liberty, which is the presumption of innocence. Nobody is guilty of anything on the basis of an accusation. You've got to have more than just an accusation. A person is not guilty of murder because a cop said you, you murdered somebody. A person is not guilty of murder uh, because a uh, This. I categorically and unequivocally de deny the allegation against me by Dr. Ford. America is watching, and as we choose a lifetime seat on our highest court, we cannot have any doubt. Well, the ACLU uh, is about basic principles, due process, individual liberty, and last time I checked, uh, innocent until proven guilty, and comparing Brett Kavanaugh to uh, President Clinton, obviously DNA evidence in that case, <laughs> Bill Cosby, multiple uh, accusations of corroborated sexual harassment uh, and worse. Uh, how does that comport with the overall mission of the ACLU? Well, look, you know, the thing here is that we didn't have an investigation. Uh, we had Don McGahn minutes after uh, the Senate was forced to say we we're going to do an FBI investigation, say, hey, we can't have him talking to everybody. There were dozens of witnesses that were put forward by Dr. Ford and others that just were not talked to. They didn't even speak to Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh, the, the people Well, because it was involved. a supplemental investigation and well, they had both it, testified for you hours You brought up the DNA hours. evidence and all that stuff. We could have had some of that if we would have had actual investigation. How does that the problem wait a here is that we didn't have that. How did wait a second. That at all? Will, I... You? I, I adore Will. Can... Michael, yeah. hold on. I adore Will, but he just said we might have had something like DNA evidence had we had <laughs> we more We would have had interviews. more evidence. Okay. Not uh, DNA. All right. Yeah, I don't years. think so. They weren't they... even doing DNA. Yeah, I don't, okay. Ago. Well, I mean, um, Michael, again, the ACLU, I have to say when I was at Dartmouth mm -hmm. uh, and we got into hot water with a college newspaper that I was working for, the Dartmouth Review, I remember when... Ira Glasser, Glasser, who was, I think, executive, executive director of the ACLU, stood up for us because we were student journalists. But I'm sure he didn't like a lot of the stuff we were doing. We were kind of, you know, we were, we were acting sophomore, we were sophomores in, in college. But they stood up for us. And yeah. that gave me a sense of what the ACLU was all about. It wasn't partisan. Right. ACLU used to stand for nonpartisanship, they never took a position either for or against candidates for office or nominees for the court. Now it's different. They have a pretense of non-partisanship, and they always say now in all their literature, we are non-partisan. We don't endorse, we don't oppose, but, however, and then they go on and, and, give, and, give, and give credence to that they oppose people they disagree with. They will that's call not them the, for an That's investigation, not the ACLU. I don't, know, I don't know what you know about your, the mission of the ACLU. I, obviously, you haven't read the policies of the, NAA, of the ACLU. You haven't I used read to work the, at the NAACP. You have, you, I, I said the ACLU. No, you said you, NAACP. I know, because I used to work at the NAACP, the <laughs> national office. I was what, happened? Nat, what happened to you, man? I was you, assistant man? national director of the NAACP. Under Roy Wilkins and Ben Hooks. They're that's rolling the, in their graves. That's when the organization was principled. That's when the organization knew that, Look, pe one, one that three people women, had rights one three and individual women rights have and been the sexually freedom assaulted of speech. In this country. Okay, guys, here, do we have time one for this? I just want to play this one thing. Okay, this is from Susan Herman, this uh, At Liberty podcast. I want you guys to listen <clears throat> very, very closely. The president of the ACLU. I think we did want to make that statement and to disagree with those who say, well, you shouldn't pay any attention to her because you don't have objective corroboration. So and yeah, I think this is our statement that we do believe that women should be believed. 
All right, really quick, you got 10 seconds. Quick. All women should be believed, yes? One in three women are victims of sexual assault. I have three daughters. I okay. want their allegations to be taken seriously and investigated. It didn't happen here. Okay. You guys can celebrate all, all women, you want, but all it wasn't women investigated. All women should be believed, whether there's corroboration or not. It should be investigated. Okay, it well, was not yes. done. Okay, uh, that's, real quick, Mike, that's, real that's quick, just, 10 seconds. That's just absurd. Because somebody is a woman, you have to believe them? Because somebody says they're a victim of a crime, you have to believe them? No, that's not how we live in America. You have to investigate. That's not due process. That's not fairness. Right, right, that's guys, not the presumption of innocence. All right, guys, we'll have you both back. We got a lot more on this to cover. <laughs> and by the way, a Women's March co-founder saying support for Kavanaugh equals support for bigotry and racism. Seems like a pretty big jump to me. Diamond and Silk here to respond. Next. When he was mocking her, there were people laughing. There were people laughing. And you know, I'm the resident Czech white women person in the Women's March. So let me tell you who was laughing. White women were standing there laughing with their white husbands. Do not allow people to be comfortable around you supporting racists and bigots. It is not okay. That was Women's March co-chair Tamika Mallory with a message to white women following the president's fact check of Christine Ford the other night. Here with their reaction are Diamond and Silk. Ladies, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Oh, All right, hi. Diamond. Diamond, what's your reaction to Miss Mallory here? Well, listen, you have to understand that, first of all, the president wasn't mocking anybody. What he was doing was calling out inconsistencies in Dr. Ford's story, and we all was agreeing with him, the people in his audience and the people at home. That's, That's right. the first thing. And second, 
the second thing is, this is what the Democrats do, the liberals do. When they can't beat you with the race card, they use the sex card. They use, they say you're mocking, they call you a bigot. That's why we have to march to the polls and vote right, vote for red, vote Republican. Uh, Silk, there's this uh, actor, singer, Bette Midler, I know you know, remember Beaches? Uh, she said this in a tweet on Thursday, yesterday, women are the N-word of the world. She's since deleted the tweet. Raped, beaten, enslaved, married off, work like dumb animals, denied education, inheritance, enduring the pain and danger of childbirth, and life in silence for thousands of years. They are the most disrespected creatures on earth. Silk. Um, I really believe that it's really a shame as to how you tie I uh, want to tie beautiful women and women to the N-word. You know, when I look at uh, Beth, I look at the fact that you, she's a Democrat. And this is exactly what they do. You know, if you look at the liberals and the Democrats, they are the party of slavery. And look at the slave masters. What did they call their slaves? Hmm. So she understands the N-word. She knows what it means to be the N-word. However, I think that she should not tie women to the N-word, and she shouldn't even be saying the N-word. I thought we laid that word to rest. Uh, Diamond, did you uh, have any thoughts when you see the very angry, rage-filled protesters uh, filling the Capitol, filling the Senate uh, hard office building, all the, you know, some celebrities like Amy